uh, really looking forward to moderating this panel uh, today. Good afternoon to everybody. And uh, uh, we're going to be talking about transportation hubs, a multimodal approach, as Tim said. Uh, as we all know, there have been uh, significant investments in a number of modalities, uh, whether it's rail or first last mile uh, connectivity. And connectivity of these various mod modalities is becoming a, a major discussion. And, and some say that mobility hubs are the new centers of mobility. And that the hubs are not just going to be a place where transportation converges to make things easier, but they're also something that, are, that is uh, going to be a place that's attractive, where people are going to want to spend their time and what have you. Um, but in order to have these conversations, we're, we're going to have some discussion about the different modalities and do a little bit of a deep dive there. We're going to talk about um, how the convergence of modes leads to a sustainability discussion in these various urban centers. And we have a great panel for you today that uh, will address different modes of transportation, energy and sustainability considerations, community considerations, and impacts. So we've gonna, we have a lot that we're going to explore, and I'm really looking forward to that. So without further ado, I want to briefly introduce our panelists, and, uh, and then I'm going to ask them to do a brief introduction of themselves and their organizations. So uh, first we have, to my far right, we have LaDonna DiCamillo, who's the Southern California Regional Director for California High Speed Rail Authority. Uh, we have next to her, we have Deb Schrimmer, a Senior Advisor for Urban and Community Charging, the U.S. Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. Uh, then we have Daniel Thompson, Senior Program Manager of Innovation, Partners, and Product for Schneider Electric. And we have Jacob Lieb next to me, Senior Director of First Last Mile Planning at LA Metro. And LA Metro's had a lot of representation at this conference, so Jacob, welcome. We're happy to have you with us. So with that being said, uh, why don't we start with a little bit of a self-introduction. Uh, tell us a little bit about you, your organization, and what some of your priorities are. And so uh, why don't I start with you, Jacob? Well, thanks. Um um, it's great to be on this panel. Good to see all, you, all of you this afternoon, and welcome to Los Angeles if you're visiting. Uh, my name is Jacob Lieb. I um, manage our first last mile planning program at Metro. Uh, as Beth mentioned, you've heard a lot from Metro folks over the last few days, including our top executives. So I'm not going to talk about all of the things that Metro has going on and sort of our, our top priorities and challenges. I'm going to talk about what I work on, um, which is first last mile connectivity to our transit network. Um, so our uh, big innovation, our big thought uh, around First Last Mile, uh, at least for um, our transit riders um, in Los Angeles, is that, um, and it's not going to sound super revolutionary, but believe me, it is. Um, people who are going to their transit trip um, or going from their transit trip to their final destination should be able to walk. They should be able to ride a bike, skateboard, um, a wheelchair. Uh, push a stroller, and they should be able to do it in a way that's safe, um, dignified, maybe even pleasant, uh, and doesn't force them to do silly things like uh, cross the street three times when they when they where they want to go is directly immediately across the street. Um, so what we work on is preparing plans um, that um, try to retrofit the streetscape around our transit mm -hmm. stations. Our transit stations are often um, superimposed in some of the world's most um, auto-oriented and sometimes the most unfriendly um, environments um, for transit riders given the needs that they have. Um, so we have had a lot of success over the years um, developing these plans. There are now 60 of the stations that um, through the system that, that we operate uh, for which we've completed plans. And we work with local agencies, our partners who own and maintain and, uh, and operate the public right-of-way. Um, on capital projects to improve the infrastructure around our stations and to, to meet those goals that I talked about, safe, dignified, connected um, networks for people to walk and ride a bike. Great. Thank you, Daniel. You're up next. All right. Um, so I worked for Schneider Electric uh, 23 years. Uh, I've come up through the sales uh, channel the first decade of my career. And then, um, you know, started, we started building electric vehicle charging stations in 2009. So I've seen you know, what was sort of the, the early era of EV charging, and then that's morphed into more complicated areas. So specifically, 
Um, I got out of the management track a couple years back, and I have uh, sort of my dream job right now. I get to work with our, uh, we have a billion dollar uh, corporate venture fund, and so we, you know, we invest in a lot of emerging technology companies, and you know, we just don't like to give the money and say go away and bring us back some profit, but you know, we like to try to amplify their technology and bring them into new pilot projects. So I get to work with a lot of. Uh, fun and diverse uh, customers that are building uh, across all modalities of electric vehicles at all types of different chargings. And that's very exciting for me. Um, and then um, really being able to see the future and you know, what are these best practices as people move through pilot projects and, and you know, move into the mainstream. So that gets me out of bed uh, in the morning. I really enjoy the, the, the potential to, to improve the world as we find it. And um, yeah, so that's me in two minutes. And back to you, Deb. Go ahead, Deb. Thank you so much for having me on this panel. Um, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. My name is Deb Schrimmer, and I'm a senior advisor for the uh, newly two years old uh, created U.S. Uh, Joint Office of Energy and Transportation, where I'm a senior advisor um, really focused on bringing uh, this really exciting moment in transportation electrification to communities all over the country. I'm a transportation planner by background and I'm really interested in the intersection between people and the built environment and how we get around. Um, and the kind of particular relationship that I have with this work uh, is largely shaped by my previous role where I spent almost the last seven years at Lyft working on shared mobility modes like rideshare uh, and shared bikes and scooter networks. And what I'm really excited about with the Joint Office is our mission is to make it possible for everyone to ride and drive electric. And I think uh, the drive electric part is pretty well understood, thinking about individuals that own uh, electric vehicles and live in homes where it might be a single family home and they have a garage and it's really easy to charge that vehicle. But if we want everyone to drive and ride electric, we sort of have to think beyond uh, that very easy use case uh, to provide charging for and think about all the other ways that people interact with this electric uh, mobility system. So that may be thinking about charging solutions for folks in multifamily housing that don't have uh, a garage to charge at. How, how do they, no pun intended, plug in to this charging network? Um, what about people who either can't afford to own a car or choose to live a car-free or car-light lifestyle? How do they plug into this electrified transit network? How do they rely on electrified uh, microtransit or uh, ride hail or car share systems? And thinking about all of those unique challenges uh, within a city where space is at a premium, impacts to the grid uh, are you know, very significant and trying to weave that together. Great, thank you. LaDonna. Good afternoon, um, LaDonna DiCamillo with California High Speed Rail Authority. Um, excited to be part of this panel. We're kind of the hub connector. Uh, at least we're, we're trying to, to build the hub connections uh, with high speed rail. I like to remind folks uh, of the mega nature of our project. We were implemented or, or initiated by the voters in 2008 uh, by Proposition 1A. And our, our directive, our vision, is to connect San Francisco with Los Angeles, Anaheim, or to make the San Francisco to LA connection in two hours and 40 minutes, which is a major feat. Um, and we are, we are working on that. We're limited in the number of stations that we can put in. Uh, we want to be competitive, and we want to we wanna be able to make that connection in an attractive way so that we're not stopping a lot. <clears throat> on the other hand, we do rely on a lot of other transportation providers to, to make the interconnections. So um, with that, we have, we have worked since 2008 to identify our phase one, 500 mile alignment. And we've environmentally cleared 422 miles of that alignment. There are two project sections still in Southern California we're working on mm -hmm. uh, for environmental clearance. We are under construction on 119 miles in the Central Valley. And we're designing um, kind of to complete 171 miles in the Central Valley to, to connect Merced with Bakersfield. And recently just went through, uh, got an authorization to start procurement on train equipment, which is really exciting. 
Um, so we're, we're hoping to have a test system up and running early 2030 range because we have to build the equipment, um, put the systems in place. Uh, but it, it is exciting. We are making progress a little bit at a time. And uh, appreciate your having us on the panel to talk about what we're working on. Great. Thanks, LaDonna. So we are going to be talking today about uh, multimodal transportation as well as getting to the m mobility hub discussion. But we also had a really good conversation when we were preparing for this. It had to do with the nexus between transportation and energy. And Debs, this is, this is like where you sit, right, uh, where those two things come together. Um, so I think that'll be a good fi foundation for the remainder of our dialogue. So I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about that. And you know, you have an office that was specifically launched to leverage that. So why don't you share a little with us about that? Sure. So uh, our friends at DOT yesterday talked a little bit about this, but yesterday was the two-year anniversary of truly historic legislation, the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, which is really dramatically uh, reimagining and uh, reinvesting in our infrastructure across the country, including helping deliver the president's you know, very ambitious agenda uh, to install uh, 500,000 charging stations across the country. And so um, that is really, really big and bold. And the uh, understanding was that in order to make that possible, uh, this is not just a DOT transportation initiative, and this is not just a DOE uh, energy initiative, we really have to bring the best and brightest minds together to execute against this really important uh, goal. And that requires the transportation expertise of understanding traffic and the network and how things you know, exist in the built environment, but also from an energy perspective, you know, what sort of investments to the grid are gonna be needed to power all of these uh, chargers, um, what does this mean from a resilience uh, perspective? Uh, how do we manage demand in a way that's really thoughtful? And so the joint office was created to do that. And um, you know, we are very focused on the charging stations uh, across the country, both on highways, but in urban communities, in very small rural communities, in tribal nations. And I think being able to help bring uh, both parties to the table across the energy and transportation sectors is is so important because oftentimes you know we're talking to uh, DOTs and they haven't necessarily uh, spoken with their utilities yet, uh, which is a huge piece of the puzzle. And so I think having this joint office that sits across um, both of those uh, industries just helps getting people uh, at the table talking and collaborating and more likely to achieve the outcomes that we're trying to pursue. And thanks for sharing that. One of the things I didn't share is a little bit about HNTB. We're a transportation infrastructure firm, and uh, we actually are doing a lot of work on the, what's called the NEVI implementations. And the convergence between all of those things that you just talked about are a significant part of ensuring that's successful. So uh, we've been working with many states on that, and um, you know, really looking forward to seeing the vision of what all of that promises. And uh, we were just talking before, I, I'm actually, I, I, uh, I live in Miami, even though I'm a national practice consultant. Um, but um, but we, were, uh, we were also talking about the fact that this is news. We're in California. California is number one state in terms of electric vehicle adoption. But guess who's number two? Florida. That might surprise you all. So all of this discussion about you know, how we address the infrastructure element along with all the other things that are going to draw on that infrastructure are really important. So um, let's move on to you, LaDonna. Um, the California High Speed Rail project will connect northern, central, and southern sections of the state, just as you mentioned. You're putting a whole lot of effort into station design. So what can you tell us about the stations uh, and how you're approaching those design elements and alignment with uh, how you think the community is going to perceive that? Absolutely. We, we have a very close working partnership with the cities where we plan to have stations. Um, part of our mission with Prop 1A is to, to make sure that we have riders, right? Um, you you want to make sure that there's riders and that there's an attractive... Um, transit-oriented development at each of the station 
uh, where we where we plan to have stations. And we want to be more than just a platform. We don't want to just be a platform. So we do have a team that's working with the various cities. I shouldn't do this off the top of my head, but I'll try. San Francisco, San Jose, Merced, uh, Fresno, Kings Tulare. Um, down in my territory, you, you get to Palmdale, Burbank, Los Angeles Union Station, and then, and of course Anaheim. Um, so we we put up we we have a committee. We're trying to preserve the property use in and around the station, working with the city on the right planning. Uh, for long-term vision in and around these uh, these station areas to make sure that that there is an opportunity to make the, the connection with various modes um, of that last mile, really, to, to make it friendly for bicyclists, for uh, EV charging. We have areas that are set aside for EV charging, but, but also just the land use planning in and around so that people have a 15-minute walk from a station to whatever they need, whether it's groceries, um, a doctor's office, we, we want that hub to be around our station. We want it to be a destination, a place where people can live. And so we are constantly, um, and, and each city is, is unique in how they want to approach it, um, but, but we are working really diligently with the various communities to, to make sure that we're planning for the long term um, and we don't just arrive and have a platform. Great, thanks. Uh, I want to stay on electrification as it pertains to that just, just for a minute. And uh, Debs, I'm coming back to you, and don't worry, Daniel and Jacob, I'm coming to you next. Um, how should communities be thinking about electrification in terms of these multimodal hubs and charging in urban areas, you know, including like curbside charging, et cetera? How should folks be thinking about that? Yeah, I, I love to hear that high-speed rail is, is thinking about how people are gonna exit and enter the, um, the train experience and thinking about those first and last miles is, is so important and uh, hopefully in the future, people will, using, will be using electrified transportation modes to get there. So it's great to hear that uh, electric vehicle charging is a part of that, but I think what, what I wanna stress is that the definition of an electric vehicle is so much broader than a car and uh, oftentimes, the best way to travel uh, to a rail station may be in uh, a, on a bicycle, um, on a scooter, on foot, maybe uh, a shared a shared vehicle. And so, I think when we think about uh, electrification at multimodal hubs, um, you know, at the Department of Transportation, they talk a lot about this idea of digging once. And as we're going to be spending these uh, $7.5 billion to build this electric vehicle charging station, we want to future-proof it and get it right the first time. And so by digging once and thinking about multiple modes of transportation and how they connect uh, is really important. So when you're trenching, you know, making sure that the bike share station that's on uh, the, you know, the right-of-way at the train station, making sure that that also is able to get plugged in to recharge the e-bikes when people bike there. That's really important. Or the cars that people are taking and maybe leaving for extended periods of time. Uh, making sure that that multimodal approach is being translated into uh, these electrification efforts is just really important and helps give better returns on investment. Would anybody else like to weigh in on that? Uh, maybe uh, even Jacob in terms of LA Metro, you wanna opine on, on uh, what Debs just said? Can you hear me? Am I on? Okay. Um, so uh, may get a, a little ahead of myself here um, in terms of um, where we are in the conversation, but um, you know, I think we tend to think and talk in, in panels a lot about the modes, uh, and and I think as we, when we format conversations around hubs, it's about what modes are converging at these hubs. Um, when we um, talk to transit riders. Um, about what their needs are, um, what they tell us consistently every time is we need shade in the daytime uh, and we need lighting uh, at nighttime. Uh, and then maybe sometimes when we're able to uh, draw out the conversation a little bit more, um, you know, we'll say, you know, do you need a crosswalk uh, here block from the station and, you know, where you might get to your kid's school? And they'll say, yeah, we need that too. Um, what they don't typically say is, I need um, this new device or gadget 
um, that helps me get to uh, my transit trip. So I, I promised you I might say something a little bit provocative. Um, it's after lunch. Uh, last this day is the, the conference. perfect venue for it, Jacob, um, so you, you can go for it. Um, so I, I worry that, um, and, and I think this is borne out in the work that my team has done over the years, um, that like tech-focused innovation uh, is an excuse and a distraction to not take care of the basics and not do the things that transit riders will tell us every day that they need. That's really important. I mean, one of the things we talk about, look, the innovation, the technology is great. But you can't have those conversations just for the sake of talking about technology and trying to force technology into a solution, right? You got to start with what are the goals, what are the needs, and you got to start there. And the technology enabled solutions could come into play to help make that easier, better, more efficient, safer, and whatnot. So, completely agree, completely agree with what you just said, Jacob. Um, Daniel, I'd like to ask you a little bit about emerging technologies. Um, what are some of the emerging technologies to, to kind of stay on the electric charging um, element? And feel free to broaden that if you'd like to, but, oh, yeah. but what should we be aware of and what should we be leveraging? I think specifically when we, when we think about high-level trends and, and just to piggyback on, on Deb's comment, and we, we have the convergence of, of energy and transportation, and, and what we also have is the convergence of, of data and power in, in, the, same, in the same sort of a node. So um, one of the, I, I, I work a, a lot, I sit on a board for the National Science Foundation Aspire Engineering Research Center. And our uh, goal is to make dynamic wireless power transfer a reality by 2030. So when we talk about you know future-proofing systems and you know only digging once, you know that great advice, but also you know being nimble and being able to stay on your, you know the balls of your feet. You know technology is is moving very fast, and we think about like iPhones, right? Everybody understands that paradigm. In 07, it was released. We got to know what apps were. Then we understood what a killer app was, and who really knew what a killer app was. And, you know, fast forward ten years, you know, the the kids date different. So a stranger picks you up at your house. People bring you groceries. There's all these new things unlocked, and you know, being able to electrify roadway lanes for heavy duty transport, uh, or being able to deploy those systems in, uh, you know, Sandag just put out uh, an RFI a couple years back, uh, uh, looking about how they connect the different stakeholders of their constituency um, through, you know, wireless infrastructure, and that that gives you the value proposition that increases utilization, right? And so, that one of the big challenges that we all face is this whole chicken and egg scenario, and utilization, you know, is the solution. Multimodal is the the opportunity to converge different. Uh, utilization streams into a single node, and that gives you the basic economics to green light a project that maybe like two to three years ago wasn't wasn't done. So, I mean, wireless is is one sort of tool in the toolbox that I think we'll see deployed. But smarter systems. Um, right now, I'm I'm leading our company's effort with uh, de the Department of Energy Super Truck Three. Uh, Super Truck 3 uh, is an evolution. Super Truck 1 was just really about the powertrain. Super Truck 2 was about the whole truck envelope. And Super Truck 3 is about the whole logistic system. So we have you know, regional delivery, final mile, uh, long haul, all kind of converged into one private client ecosystem, interplant, all of that. So you know, when we think multimodal, I think, you know, a lot of us gravitate towards urban centers and, you know, public transportation, but multimodal is is a much more broad concept that applies even shared resources, right? If a, a company A and company B want to get together and increase utilization, they can they can look at that sort of partnering and, and through a, a, a larger lens. That's great. Would anybody else like to weigh in on that? I, I will add this, because um, you mentioned Aspire, and when you're talking about wireless, you're including inductive charging uh, in that space? Yeah, inductive, capacitive, there's a lot of, of, of fun technologies. You know, we have to work out the interoperability and figure out you know, which ones are, are best for what types of applications, but yeah, it's a wide, wide ranging. Dynamic, semi-dynamic, static, wireless charging. And you mentioned interoperability. I mean, that's one of the things that I learned with inductive charging. You can't just have it there and expect every vehicle 
with any type of battery can actually interact with that. So it's really important interoperability. And when you mentioned Aspire, um, in Florida, Central Florida Expressway Authority is partnered there as well and is planning on piloting uh, that technology as well. Oh, yeah. And that's the thing. You know, uh, I remember just a couple years back going around to senior leaders in my company and trying to get people excited about it. And I, one leader said, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a truck out there that's wireless or a highway. But, you know, there are pilot programs like the Central Ex Florida Expressway. It's like two miles of electrified proof of concept, uh, you know, Pennsylvania Turnpike, Ohio Turnpike. In dot, M dot. Uh, there's a lot of uh, real efforts to to bring this to America's roadways. Well, and even the SunTrax uh, testing facility that is owned by the Florida Turnpike Enterprise is also uh, testing that as well. Um, so it's very interesting what's happening, and I'll be curious to see how that all plays out because it, it doesn't usually play out the way you originally envision it, right? And we have a number of pivots along the way. Uh, I want to talk about this a little bit differently for a moment. I want to talk about the concept of sustainability, one of the things that has really driven these various approaches and whatnot, and just kind of get your, um, your thoughts in terms of your organization's approach to sustainability, how does all of this fit in relative to your commitment and whatnot, and uh, LaDonna, I'd like to start with you on that, if you might. Sure, thanks. Spath, thank you, Beth. Um, we have a sustainability program uh, and a sustainability officer. It is not me, sorry. I'm not the expert, but I've done as much as I can to absorb uh, what that team is doing. And a lot of times people start with sustainability as your emissions offput and, and your energy use. That is one factor of sustainability. Uh, but we just put out our sustainability report uh, this, this month, and it, it covers a wide range of other things. So I want to talk a little bit about really quickly about some different factors that we include in our sustainability approach. Of course, we are high-speed rail, 100% electric. We are committed to renewable energy. Um, and we have a team that's, that's looking to make sure that we can get those, those renewable, reliable <laughs> renewable energy sources to where we need them when we need them. So that, that is a bit of a major feat as well. During our construction, we're constantly looking for ways to reduce emissions uh, using the best technology available for our construction teams. Um, as part of that, we actually have a, a natural resources conservation program where we try to recycle our construction materials. And so we're constantly looking at ways to recycle um, what's coming from our construction sites. We have, um, so that we don't utilize landfills, of course, we have a preservation program as part of our, our natural resources uh, commitment. And then um, we, we categorize economic development and governance within the sustainability and, and really want to focus th that what we're doing is helping the state um, and helping disadvantaged communities in particular. So our, our alignment touches disadvantaged communities, also benefits disadvantaged communities. And we are constantly working with um, our, our trades, our construction trades, to make that connection to those who reside in the community. We have about a 65% local um, hire, so that 65% of our workers on our program are coming from those local disadvantaged communities. And then we have a very aggressive small business engagement program, too, that we're constantly trying to, to um, engage small businesses. And we consider that all part of sustainability, that sustainability um, within our community, working with the community to make sure that that they are engaged in what we're doing um, as as we move forward. Well, and and uh, just to put kind of an exclamation point on a couple of things that you said, even just the whole everything that we're talking about, and and really pervasive through a lot of these discussions here at Comotion, that whole workforce development aspect, the job. So there's the there's the benefiting of the community and making sure you're deploying these well so they have seamless mobility and a host of mobility options, but then there's the other, the other aspect of it which has to do with job creation and, and uh, creating opportunities for those even in underserved communities to, to be able to have good, sustainable work. And, and it's great to see that that's something that you're, you're looking at. Uh, anybody else wanna weigh in on sustainability approaches? 
I'll take a, a sure. swing. Um, so, you know, we were named uh, two years ago by Corporate Knights as the most sustainable company on the on the planet, and we've had a lot of our work kind of called out in various forms for a signature, the RE100, the EV100. Uh, we're looking at uh, making all, not only our commitments uh, that we publicly made, but making the, the work that we're doing to support those transparent um, so that, you know, we benchmark with other companies. Um, and we, we leave that op open so that people can understand. And then the, the products that we're also bringing to the table, uh, they help enable our carbon reduction, our sustainability advancement, as well as our clients. So we kind of get uh, the ability to, to test out our, our new solutions in our own, own kitchen, which, which we really like. But I, when it just kind of tie things back to multimodal approach and one of the big trends that we're seeing is you know sort of a departure from the paradigm of the traditional role of the utility in um, the infrastructure, and we use the term prosumer, which is really just a blurring of producer and consumer. You know, we have a multimodal that brings this opportunity again for um, various power flow uh, scenarios, resiliency in in systems. Um, the ability to store energy and the emergence of, of new DC uh, enabled technologies that that'll really unlock new value propositions that you know going back to my iPhone uh, metaphor that we we didn't even really understand five years ago. So that's that gets me excited uh, about sustainability, uh, knowing that you know it's not it's not antithetical to being profitable. That you can you know unlock new business models make. You know, new industries out of sustainability, and that's that's great. You know, that's the kind of forcing function that we really need to drive society forward. Go ahead. Jake. I grab this one too. Uh, so I, I think Ladonna's on on the right track, or I think tend to think the same way. Um, in the transportation world, I think there's this push and pull for you know, sustainability between. Uh, and sort of our operational and fleet sustainability. What what are our facilities um, and and um, vehicles? Uh, what's our carbon footprint versus what's our societal contribution um, to sustainability? Um, and I tend to think that for for us as a transit agency, like the highest goal is is butts and seats. Um, I, I haven't seen any numbers to this effect, but I imagine. Um, a full diesel bus, and we don't run diesel buses, we run CNG buses and we're transitioning to electric. But I imagine a full diesel bus probably has, um, is probably more beneficial than an empty electric bus. Um, and, um, and, I, and I also wanna just observe that like, uh, even before the pandemic, um, we were on a trajectory with declining ridership for several years, and there was a lot of study and, and, and thought and conjecture into what was going on there. Um, so that and some of the explanations were like it's you know there's easily and cheap easily available and cheap car loans uh, and so a lot of our core customers are um, buying their first car uh, one of the interesting studies found that uh, people that that some of the like the ridership losses were concentrated on just a couple of bus lines over the vast uh, metro transit system in LA which really indicated like we're losing ridership in the places where like transit riders were living but can't afford to live anymore. Um, so it, and point being like it's more complicated than than just the um, operational sustainability um, for a transit rider. But I, I tend to think that the way for us to be sustainable and to sort of make a dent into transportation's role in the overall carbon emissions um, as a society is just to focus on meeting what people's actual needs are. Thanks a lot, Jacob. Um, Daniel mentioned a word, uh, profitability, and it made me think of money. So that means I have to go to Deb ne Deb's next, <laughs> right, to talk about funding and funding opportunities, you know, coming at the federal level. I mentioned uh, NEVI, which is a huge program, uh, significant investment in electrification infrastructure around the country. Uh, but what more can you share with us even beyond that, uh, whether it's related to electrification or uh, promoting uh, development of uh, mobility hubs and what have you? Sure, sure. So um, the bipartisan infrastructure law is a huge, huge uh, comprehensive infrastructure package. But at the joint office, we uh, specifically help uh, our partners at Federal Highways Administration, Federal Transit Administration, 
and the Environmental Protection Administration uh, administer a few key funding programs, well, one of which you've you've alluded to. So there's the 5.5, uh, or excuse me, 5 billion uh, Nevi National Electric Vehicle uh, Program, and this is a formula fund that flows to states um, after they've completed their um, uh, state uh, EV plans, as well as DC, Puerto Rico. Um, but this is formula funds. So it's really focused on building out these electric vehicle um, alternative fuel corridors and making sure that there's a very um, reliable, um, available charging network when you go on that big road trip um, every 50 miles or so. Um, thinking more locally within communities and filling gaps in that network is where the CFI charging fueling infrastructure program fits in. And this is a two and a half billion dollar program um, and it's a competitive program. It's a discretionary program. And so lots of public agencies are eligible uh, to apply to that. And I think mobility hubs is really where that fits in. Um, that's like right in the community. You can bring in these multiple modes as we talked about with the dig once uh, philosophy. Uh, but then we also, you know, work with the EPA. They, admin they administer the clean school bus program, um, which is a really important way to think about uh, how are we extending clean transportation options to children getting to school, um, as well as the low no emission program at FTA. And I think also through that, while well, the low no program is really focused on clean bus replacement, um, that coordination. Um, of charging those buses and co-location uh, is where multimodal hubs can fit into that as well. Great, thank you. So you, you also talked about how you collaborate with the different agencies or different departments of USDOT, which is great. So uh, I want to keep I want to stay on uh, collaboration theme. This might be a little bit self-serving, and I'll tell you why afterwards. So um, Ladonna. Rail is a big focus in in California, particularly in Southern California, with the promise of Brightline, mm -hmm. right? Connecting Southern California with Las Vegas. Um, are you collaborating with them in any way? We, we do work with Brightline, so let's talk about what Brightline is. Brightline is a private sector high-speed rail provider. Um, so we are a public sector and we have a certain mission and we're over 200 miles per hour. Brightline private sector has a, a different approach. I, had 30 years with the private sector, so I know how they that thinks. And, um, and Brightline's making great progress from what I understand. Um, and we do talk to them a lot about interoperability of our equipment. Uh, right now their focus is on um, connecting to Las Vegas, which is great for those of us in Southern California who have to use the white knuckle freeway to get there. Um, so they're gonna they're gonna they're proposing to connect Rancho Cucamonga, which is right around Ontario Airport uh, with Las Vegas. At one time they had looked at um, the the east-west connection, high desert corridor between Victorville and Palmdale. Um, they're not pursuing that. My understanding is not they're not pursuing that at this time. And I think that's in part we're not there yet. Um, once, once we get there, uh, we are building and, and working with the city of Palmdale on a station that would accommodate their operations too. So uh, Metrolink could come into Palmdale. Um, Brightline could come into Palmdale. We would be in Palmdale. We would make that connection from there. So yeah, absolutely. We we are. I, I'm excited about Brightline and the progress that they're making. <clears throat> it might be a different operation. Um, from what I understand, where it might not be quite the same high speeds, but it is it is definitely a welcome alternative for Southern Californians who who like to make that trip to Vegas from time to time. So I'm looking forward to seeing their progress. Yeah, so now I'll qualify that statement that I made before as just being in, in South Florida. You know, Brightline is in operation there. Now the Orlando station is operational, so you can go from Miami to Orlando, and Brightline takes about three hours, and then there are a few stops along the way. And that's been a game changer for us in Florida. Um, look, we don't have a heavy rail presence in Florida, so it's been a game changer, including some of the connectivities, first last mile connectivities, those stations also you know, they have that approach of making the station an attractor, making the train a destination and whatnot. So um, so anyway, thank you for that, LaDonna. I wanna give the, um, the audience an opportunity to ask any questions. Does anybody have any questions of our panelists? It's really hard to see, so you might, yes, sir, right here. 
Oh, I'm sorry, did I miss someone over there? We'll go there next. Hello. Hi, my name is Scott Johnson from the Southern California Association of Governments. I thought uh, Jacob's comment was very compelling about, you know, getting the foundation right. Do you, at mob Mobility Hubs, obviously there's trade-offs, you know, a park and ride lot might not make the pedestrian experience as nice. Do you think there is value to creating hierarchy when you're designing things? For example, uh, let's prioritize, make sure you can walk, get a wheelchair there first to help make sure that you're getting those fundamentals right. Thank you. That, that's a great question. It's it's nice to meet you. I used to work at SCAG also. Um, so um, yes, um, and, and just really core point there. 90% um, of people who are riding the metro system every day are doing it without the use of a private car. Um, so I, I think the, the, the focus on um, walkability is sort of the secret sauce to transit and, and, and bikeability as the next layer. It's, it's intentional and it's, it's clued or keyed into uh, again, what we think um, the needs of our riders are. I, I would also go on to say that, like, not every station's the same, um, and um, and you know we are expanding our system into more, more suburban locations. Um, certainly, um, there is a need for for things like parking at end of the line stations, um, and um, and things like mobility hubs that combine parking, uh, modal connections. Um, transfers within the, the transit system. I'd say particularly as we look forward to the, the 2028 uh, Olympic Games. Um, but but for me, like core work that I do every day um, in first last mile planning, um, we're meeting the, the needs of the, the vast majority of our riders by focusing on walkability. Thank you, Jacob. Any other questions? Okay. All right, well, I'll be on the lookout for any raised hands as we continue here. Um, let's talk about uh, deployment uh, for a moment. And I know that uh, even at the federal government level and looking at grants and whatnot, I can tell you uh, ITS America, for those of you that are familiar with ITS America, uh, that organization is heavily focused on, yes, pilots are great, but there needs to now be a focus on deployment. Um, so I was wondering, Daniel, maybe you could take the first stab, and how do we actually take pilots and have those be a really good foundation for scalability and actual deployment? Uh, excellent question, and, and you know, pilot projects are, are critical. You, you gotta get new, the new technology, not only just vehicles, but new technologies in your ecosystems, and, get that real operational understanding of how they are to even decide, you know, how you will uh, sort of execute them. So we, we just use a, a basic agile methodology uh, of, of trying to, you know, prove the concept with, you know, the minimum viable project and then iterating, you know, beyond that to sort of, um, you know, increase ridership or increase um, the amount of routes that are available. And, you know, up until this point, we've, We've also had a technology gap, right? So, you know, people have been taking little chunks on, chunks on, chunks on as new sort of vehicles present that unlock different modalities, right? I, I'm probably the only person that gets excited about electric garbage trucks, but, you know, that it's it's that incremental progress of, of you know, trying one electric garbage truck out in a fleet um, before, you know, the ultimate grand vision of a totally electrified you know, refuse system that utilizes methane recapture from, from the landfill and the space for, you know, used landfill to, to host solar and other distributed energy resources. Um, so uh, limit your iteration till in, in between d individual projects, uh, but, you know, have, think big, right? That big audac audacious, hairy goal, and then, you know, what are those incremental steps you need to take to get from A to Z? Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I, I think there's a role for both pilots and deployment. And you know, at the joint office, we are very singularly focused on you know getting to that 500,000 uh, charging stations, which which is deployment. But there are so many uh, unanswered questions in this space right now. Like we are both like building the plane and flying it at the same time, trying to understand grid impacts, trying to understand, you know, how do how do these charging companies make money? Like, do these business models work? And if we really want 
uh, this to be an equitable transportation system that everyone can benefit from. Like, you know, how do we make it work in dense urban areas? How do we make it in more suburban, rural communities? And I think that uh, pilots are a really important uh, part of taking successes we've seen in very specific land use contexts or other considerations and then trying it somewhere out. And so um, one of the great things at the Joint Office is in addition to helping fund uh, programs that I've mentioned earlier through federal highways like NEVI and CFI, um, we have our own funding programs where we are looking at pilots, trying to help be that accelerator um, to test these ideas to then move into the deployment. So for folks in the audience uh, that are looking to, to be more on the pilot stage with sort of early stage prototypes and ideas, thinking about uh, reliability, thinking about you know equitable uh, business models for uh, electric mobility in underserved communities, thinking about interoperability, all, all sorts of things where there's lots of unanswered questions, um, check out our funding opportunities. Uh, we have the Ride and Drive Electric uh, program, and you know there may be funding opportunities in the future to look at that, but I think um, it, it really needs to be a both-and approach here because there's just so many things happening and so many unanswered questions that we can't just uh, deploy without knowing uh, with confidence that uh, we're making good bets that these things will scale, that these things will work, or, or that, you know, uh, that they'll be sustainable and still work five years from now. I'll take this one as well, just quickly. Um, in, in street infrastructure, I think we've, we've made a lot of headway and had a lot of momentum over the years with sort of light touch or temporary um, improvements. Um, and I think where we are right now is like the jump from temporary to permanent is a funding challenge. Um, like you can't get a grant um, to upgrade a temporary project uh, to a permanent project. So that, I think that's the, like the next hump to get over. I was, as I was thinking about like this panel and my, my like um, general orneriness around uh, tech innovation, the one thing I was like, what am I gonna talk about that's that's tech that, I, that, that I'll say positive things about? Um, so what made the news locally recently was um, um, 3D printed um, uh, curb protected bike lanes. Uh, and I love that. We want more of that. Uh, and, it, and it may be, you know, part of the solution for just pro like efficient and cost-effective project delivery generally in this uh, in this specific question around um, upgrading our temporary uh, soft touch infrastructure to to permanent infrastructure. That's great, thank you, Jacob. All right, so we're getting close to the end now. Uh, I do want to ask one more question and. I uh, want to talk about successes uh, and successful outcomes. I mean, you've all been engaged with communities that inform your strategies. Um, what successes are you seeing? You know, whether they're early successes or hints of successes or otherwise. And uh, I'm actually going to come back to you, Jacob, on this one first. So since we're talking about like public right of way and street infrastructure, it's a slow process on uh, in the in the public realm and and. Uh, in funding processes and so forth. So where we are right now, uh, and the success that we have that that we're really proud of, um, is our program is set up to uh, prepare plans, uh, and sort of spit those plans out in bulk, um, and then empower our partners at the local agency level to get funding. Uh, and that's been super successful. We've now got, uh, of the 60 some odd stations for which we prepared plans, almost a third of them now have funded infrastructure projects and they're just out competing um, other local agencies in the, uh, in the grant world. That's really great. Anybody else like to add? I, I'm particularly proud of what we've been doing to overcome the, um, the chicken and egg. Uh, and there's a lot of upfront capital required to deploy infrastructure. And we've been able to innovate creative ways. Um, Brookville, Maryland, we, we built a, a bus depot for uh, three different agents agencies to use to charge. Uh, we installed 70 DC fast chargers, uh, and we own and operate that facility as a service to the to the municipal under a, a private partner private public partnership, which I think is great. Um, but from just a technical perspective, we only increase the daily load after adding all those chargers and all that load, we only increase the average daily load by uh, 70, uh, 70 kilowatt hours a day, which is like nothing when you really look at you know EV charging infrastructure. Okay, anybody else? 
So it's a little early um, for us to talk about successes um, of the projects that we hope to fund through NEVI and CFI. Um, the, that money is just starting to flow. But I think kind of taking a step back, um, what I see as a success is this um, like real buy-in around electrification and, and this like uh, commitment uh, across the country. Um, it was a really big deal for us to see all 50 states submit a state NEVI plan, which really speaks to uh, just the true diversity across the country of communities of different shapes and sizes wanting to be a part of this and, and help build uh, this you know, next milestone in our uh, country's transportation network. So I'm, I'm excited and see that as a success because I think it's really hard to get everyone in the country to agree on anything. So seeing all of those state plans come in and see that commitment towards electrification uh, feels like a very big success. Go ahead. Old I'll take a different spin on it because we're high speed rail and we're more at a macro level of those interconnections. And I've been with the authority for three years. I see as a success us being able to advance our environmental clearances. I know that, that there were some struggles with the organization. We were very small, relying on a little, probably too much on consultants. Uh, but we have made tremendous progress in the last uh, three or four years. Uh, two environmental documents in Northern California have been, have been approved. Uh, two in Southern California since I've been with the authority. People say, well, well you know, why does it take so long? I can argue that the environmental process makes the project better, and I'm excited to be a part of it and, and interacting with the community. You've, you've got to find that balance of advancing the project, and, and you can't be everything to everybody. <laughs> so, so I'm excited about these successes, and I want to touch just really briefly on the, the remaining project section uh, between Palmdale and Burbank. And the reason it's last is it's our engineeringly worst, uh, biggest feat. Um, because it's going to require 28 miles of tunneling. But it's also the biggest game changer because we can connect Southern California with the Antelope Valley in, in a 12-minute trip where it could take an hour and a half to two hours. And so that's what gets me motivated each day and excited. And um, I, I look forward to showing Californians that we can be successful at high-speed rail and get our environmental work done, our construction done, and uh, provide high-speed rail for Californians. That's great, LaDonna, thank you. So uh, we're out of time, but I wanna do one quick lightning round thing. Sound bites, please. Is there anything that you wanna put an exclamation point on that we talked about today, or even if we haven't talked about it, that you wanna make sure that our audience here walks away with? And uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot first, Jacob. I think I've said it about six times, but meet transit riders' needs. Great, Daniel? Uh, push utilization through creativity. Debs? I'm going to say dig once and think about multiple modes. <laughs> Excellent. LaDonna, you get the last word. I kind of stole my own my own thunder. Let, let's provide high speed rail for for Californians so that we have that intermodal connection across California. That's great. So I want to thank this amazing panel. It's been awesome to work with you, and I want to thank Comotion again for wonderful programming. We appreciate you so much for bringing us all together. Thank you, and thank you all for sitting in and having this great conversation with us. Have a great uh, close out of the conference. It's coming soon.